Hi, everybody. I'm Scott Hards, and we are here today with a very, very special podcast for you. We haven't done like anything like this uh, in the past because, frankly, we haven't had the opportunity to. Uh, and we're really happy to be able to bring you an interview with a very special guest today. So today, as you may have already noticed from the huge number of uh, book copies that I have set out here in, in our studio, we're going to be interviewing the author of the recently released Pure Invention, none other than Matt Alt. And he joins us today by Skype. Hi, Matt. Hi there. Thanks so, for having me on. Yeah. Who the heck is Matt Alt? Now, some of you may uh, be uh, privileged enough to have already know uh, about Matt's exploits, but for those of you who aren't, let me uh, fill you in very briefly. Uh, Matt has uh, been published a number of times uh, with stuff about Japan. He's published, of course, Pure Invention, his latest, and we'll get into that in detail in a moment. Uh, but there's my personal favorite, Hello, Please, which I think is the greatest title ever, uh, yes. about uh, crazy English in Japan. We've got Yokai Attack, which uh, covers Japanese folklore. We've got uh, Yurei Attack, which also kind of covers Japanese folklore. Perhaps, Matt, you could tell me later a little bit more about the difference between a Yurei and a Yokai. Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then there's Ninja Attack. Uh, all uh, English language books that Matt has published about Japan. Uh, have I missed any? No. those are Actually, those ones you were talking about, I did together with Hiroko Yoda, my wife and co-conspirator in okay. writing about ninjas and monsters and uh, ghosts. Uh, Pure Invention is my solo debut, I guess you could say. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I do lots of stuff here in Japan. I've been living here for about 20 years. Um, I moved here in 2003. And Hiroko and I founded what's called a localization company. It's, we specialize in translating mm -hmm. uh, things for Japanese entertainment companies, mainly video game companies, but okay. also... Toy companies, and one in particular that uh, your customers might be familiar with by the name of Bandai. We do yeah, a lot of and work I, with I them. I think that's why a lot of our uh, viewers here have, have tuned in today, because, of course, we're <laughs> going to push that very heavily in the PR for this podcast. But in those 20 years, you've also managed to squeeze in some work uh, appearing on television for NHK. Sure, yeah, yeah. I was uh, the, the, the national broadcaster here. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I was the co-host for uh, quite a few years of a show called Japanology Plus, which mm -hmm. uh, stars a wonderful gentleman named Peter. Peter Barracon. Oh, yes. And, I've met Peter. Uh, yeah, Peter's great. And uh, Peter's been doing various incarnations of that show for, man, it must be 15 years now. And mm -hmm. in the latest incarnation of it, Japanology Plus, I jumped in for a few seasons to uh, kind of play the foil, so to speak. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Peter, would be, Peter would be covering the intellectual side of some Japanese phenomenon, and then, you know, they would throw me out of a helicopter or something. You know, it would, it would be, it was, I was kind of the more the stuntman, the fall guy, so to speak. Right, right. Uh, Peter's kind of measured uh, explorations of uh, sophisticated Japanese culture. It was great. It's, right. uh, we're still good friends today. He's, he's a great guy. And I, I think I've also seen your work lately in uh, The New Yorker, is it? Yeah, uh, so murder you know, hornets. Yeah, I, I I began life as a a translator, a career, I should say. I, right. I began life before I was a translator, believe it or not. Uh, but I began my my uh, work life as a translator. Uh, first, a technical translator for the for the American government, and then after Hiroko and I founded Alt Japan, our localization company, as a translator and localizer of Japanese content, but. Over the years, uh, as we worked with so many different, uh, you know, content producers here in Japan, we got this mm -hmm. crazy idea in our heads that maybe we could take a crack at making our own sorts of fun products. And that's where Hello, Please and Yokai Attack and Yurei Attack and Ninja okay. Attack came from. That was Hiroko and I kind of stretching our creative legs, so to speak. Okay. And uh, one thing led to another, and I started uh, pitching and, and landing pieces in various magazines and newspapers and things like that. And that kind of took off as a, I don't know, what do you want to call it, a side career, a side mm -hmm. gig. Mm -hmm. And then the side gig started snowballing and kind of became <laughs> a main gig. Cool. So, uh, you know, as it goes. Well, uh, and just lastly for our viewers here, perhaps the most important credential for me in asking you to be on the show today uh, is that I've been privileged to call you my friend for, geez, what is it, 15 years now or so? Yeah, so uh, something we, like that. More than that, more than that. Yeah. No, 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 that no, no, no. It must be it must be over 20 years now because we started interacting in the in the very early 2000s or maybe even the late 1990s when I was co-operating a website called toyboxdx.com with a, a guy uh, named Yen. Yes, which was, yes, yes, yes. Those days. Clearing house for it was it was one of the web's first 
kind of dedicated to Japanese toys and Japanese uh, models, like uh, a website that just kind of served as a, a meeting spot for people who were mm -hmm. into that kind of stuff. And you were actually one of the early advertisers on there, I believe. And yeah, that sounds familiar. Um, I, I remember making a visit to your, your office as you let me drive the forklift. Uh, <laughs> that actually, no, no, I don't think I, I, don't know. I, I think I just sat in it, but uh, you interested me your dog who I, who I fed treats. Oh, um, goodness. Okay, well, if you remember all that, that was at least 14 years ago because we've been yeah. in our new offices where we don't have a dog for that long. So Yes, it was definitely your, your older offices when we, your right. first, I don't know if those were your first offices, but it was before you made the big move to the right. HLJ base, the base okay. star. I don't <laughs> white to base a lot of people white call to it white, exactly. white to base so yeah <laughs> extreme another attack anyway all uh, right well uh, yeah that's uh, that uh, brings back the memory so of all those things that you're doing those hats that you're wearing you mentioned the writer thing is kind of your main gig now so if if i only gave you five seconds to describe yourself to someone or you were just meeting at a cocktail party you'd say hi i'm matt alt and i'm uh somebody who doesn't want to work in somebody else's office <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's literally, you know, I, it sounds like a joke, but literally that was one of my driving uh, uh, desires as mm -hmm. as a as a young guy getting my start in a career. I just didn't want to have to work on anybody else's schedule. I knew I was I disciplined enough that I didn't need to be on a nine to five and that I could do my own projects and get my own stuff done. So uh -huh. founding All Japan was a way to give me and Hiroko uh, our own freedom to choose our projects and do the stuff we wanted to do. So, um, boy, I went way over five seconds. Sorry. <laughs> you did. <laughs> I'm a writer. I'm a professional okay. geek, whatever I, it is. You Ooh. At this particular juncture, I'm a writer. Okay. We'll go with that. Um, well, let's talk about some of your writing. Um, your your Bondi gig. Uh, now, I noticed myself like two or three years ago um, that the English on Bondi boxes and in Bondi instructions just all of a sudden got really good. And that's all your fault, basically? Well, actually, you know, we, we have been working with Bondi for, for many years before that. I, I uh -huh. think... The first project that we ever did for them was, and this is this is going to really take you back. Do you remember when the Perfect Grade series first launched? Oh, absolutely. I think it was ninety-nine. I believe the Evangelion was the first one, wasn't it? Yes, and the then ever, they, did, uh, they did the perfect. Gundam Wing Zero Custom, and then they did uh -huh. a Zaku Two. Yep. And what was that? Maybe ninety-nine, two thousand. I I don't recall the dates. Uh, ish, to be honest, but ish. It was yeah. somewhere around there, and that was one of the first projects we ever did. Unfortunately, I don't think they – at that time, there there was – and this is just – I don't know of any what, – what the internal thinking was. I'm only looking from the outside. Mm -hmm. Bandai was really making an effort to bring Gundam models into places like Toys R Us and things like that. And okay. – we were asked to translate the if you if you remember the perfect grade kits they came with these pretty detailed manual not only oh, the instructions yeah, yeah, yeah. but like little booklets yeah booklets almost like magazines kind of describing mm -hmm. the fictional uh, work that went into making these mobile suits in the in the Gundam world and things like that and what the technology was involved and we translated those uh, both for Wing Gundam and for the the Zaku too. I still remember there was like okay. a scene where they're like polishing the mono eyes. Like that was like one of the big <laughs> technological hurdles or something like that. It was very right. serious and in-depth and we did that. And one thing led to another. And more recently, uh, we've been translating catalog text mainly and PR text. Uh, well, even the, like, the side panels on the boxes and stuff now are, are really quite yeah. clear and concise. I actually don't know where that comes from. I don't know that we have been doing that stuff. But one thing is for sure, the over the last 15 years, the number of native English speakers of foreign uh, talent at Bondi has just really skyrocketed. Oh, um, really? Okay. So, then, so it's started, not always Matt. All right. No, 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 no. When we first started working, and I'm talking about people in-house at Bondi. I've never been an in-house employee. I've been inside Bondi many times but i've never i've never actually been an employee of bondi i i work for my own company and we you know they hire us when they need uh help translating text okay. um but now they have a lot of really talented people uh working in-house too so maybe they did some of that i mean it's it's Are a you, you still work with them right now i mean yeah still we still do we still do work on a regular basis for bondi yeah so, so you know about all their their upcoming secret projects then <laughs> you'll never you'll never get it out of me it's oh, Bond! Oh, come on! Bondi's not watching this podcast. It's okay. Just yeah, one little, one little nugget. Tune into you know? Tamashi Web. Isn't that what I was uh, going to say? 
Exactly. Shucks. I was hoping we could have something really juicy to promote here. All okay, right. I'll give you a hint. It involves a robot. <sighs> okay. Okay, we'll go with that for now. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Um, we got to check your street cred here, Guy. Uh, are you building Gunpla yourself? Well, you know, I not recently, but um, as a kid, I was absolutely obsessed with Gundam. Um, and Gunpla. And actually, as a kid, it was Gunpla that was my main entrance, if you want to call it, into Japanese pop culture. I was right. desperate to understand the Gundam art books that I stumbled across in the 80s and what was written on the packaging. And that was actually one of my key drives to starting to study Japanese. Oh, okay. Uh, so Gunpla, uh, Gundam models are really key to my entire connection to Japan. And uh, yeah, I built them regularly for a very long time. Mm. After college, uh, that kind of sort of dropped off. And you know, now my house is so small. I don't have like a fume hood or any of the things <laughs> you really need, like airbrushes and things like that. Well, I got pretty good at it by the you, end. You've set your sights too high. You know, with just a good pair of nippers, you can you can build all the, the latest. Uh, this uh, is true. And actually, ones, but... you, you know what? I, I'm thinking I'm thinking more like my hobby. Like in, when I was a kid, you you had to really like you had to use putty for all of the scene lines oh, yeah, 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 yeah. you know you had to do little modifications you had to paint everything now of course with the uh more recent you know starting with basically those perfect grade kits of the turn of the millennium now everything is you don't really need paint or glue at all no no not at all um what's, what's amazing, amazing kits. when you think about it now is like the the you know the perfect grade kits and i'm not uh teaching anything to anyone who might be watching this podcast but even if it's not a perfect grade some of the even some of the real grade or, or master yeah, grade yeah, kits, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know they have individually articulated you know knuckles on the hands oh, of, yeah, of yeah. the robots well, i remember some people it, it, it's remarkable to think that the original rx78 uh, Gundam kit yes. that was released by Bandai in nineteen, I think it was seventy nine. Yes, yes. The knees didn't even bend. No, the no, they were really were rigid. They were, you, know you know what? They're kind of they were kind of like the old Star Wars action figures, where uh -huh. they had a lot of kind of charm to them, and they yes. they definitely satisfied a need. But by modern standards, they're they're kind of clunky. Um, oh yeah, kind of, kind of. But not kinda. Well, I remember as a kid, really my one of my I, I really liked the kind of weird monster like mobile suits like mm. especially the aquatic ones like gog and zugok zugok yeah, and, yeah. yeah a couple of years ago i got the uh the, i forget which exact species it was but uh, a, a large scale one one hundredth scale gog mm -hmm. and like seeing that there's this entire internal skeleton now yes where you kind of put the armor on and it's actually it's developed into this kind of thing where it's almost like you know a, a kind of virtual reality with building the kits as compared to mm -hmm. what it used to be which is more of a crafty type thing yeah you know it's yeah, really the, interesting the kits, the kits these days are kind of defining the reality because many of them have far more detail than you would actually even see on screen oh sure uh, in, in any of their media sure. portrayals well, you know, yeah. if you want to think about the original Gunpla's SD, these are kind of like 4K, I guess, you know. <laughs> there you it, go. It's, it's like, you know. Um, I mean, I feel the same way about, for instance, the old, when I was a kid, my favorite toys, hands down, were Takatoku's Macross Valkyries. Oh, my gosh. They're, you should have you told me you were going to bring that up because I've got one on a shelf in the in the room next door oh, here. Oh, no. Actually, I've got no. three on the shelf in the room yeah. next door here. I, have, I, I love oh those Oh, my things. God. I, I could digress those. for an hour on that, and I'll just well. So uh, no, you know, so those. What I was to... what I was saying is those are like, like the SD version, and now the new DX Chogokin versions that Bandai is bringing yeah, yeah. out are like the high definition, like oh, super yeah. detailed versions. No, so uh, you mentioned that it was for you. It was like the the Bandai you know robots kind of got you into being interested in in Japan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, the the first thing that really hooked me was when I was here, and I, I came here without being in love with the country for the first time. First. Uh, I came and then there was like uh, Hokuto no Ken, you know, Fist of the North sure. Star. That was, for me, that was like, oh my God, I'd never seen, of course, any kind of animated thing like that uh, in the United States. Uh, and Dr. Slump also just killed me. I Just the humor of Dr. Slump. Yes. Uh, you know, by Toriyama, Toriyama Akira, the guy who eventually went on to do Dragon Ball. Oh, Dr. Uh, Slump is great. Absolutely yeah. just completely had me. Yeah, yeah. And, and wanting to understand those shows better was what really drove me to learn Japanese. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Then in my trips to department stores during my exchange experience, I ran into those those Takatoku Valkyries. Yes. And it was the most amazing toy I'd ever seen in my life. Yeah. And I believe I bought four or five of them to take home as gifts and also for my own collection. Uh, they're the classics. They were an enormous hit. Yeah, they they're were the classics. I, you know, I, a couple of years back as research for something I was writing, I got to meet one of the old Takatoku executives. Oh, really? And yeah, wow. he showed me old prototypes that Takatoku had made out of resin and wood of like the SDF-1 and uh, some of the other Macross products. And that to me was like kind of 
reaching the mountaintop, so to speak, as, as somebody who had gotten interested in Japan specifically because mm-hmm. of these toys, you know, to see the actual toys I had drooled over in the, in the you know, the little catalogs. They always used to come with little catalogs. Yes. Um, that was really cool. cool. That was stuff. a cool moment. And then, and then they, they moved on to Orgus and got it in over their head and went bankrupt. But, oh, well. <laughs> yes. And then, then they old moved to Bunga. Or something. Uh, yeah, they just invested a lot in toys that didn't sell. Well, it was a real tough business to be in, I think, you know, yeah. especially back then. You know, you, you invested all this money in a show, and if it wasn't a big hit like Orgus, you, you just basically lost all your money. Yeah. You know? So, so Takatoku Toys, rest in peace. Uh, you, you, we owe you a lot. <laughs> yes, definitely. And long live Bandai. They've been, and Bandai has actually found a niche, or it's not even a niche. I mean, they're, they're the dominant, uh, one of the two dominant toy companies here in Japan now, and they're doing oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, so um, let's move on to your book, uh, shall we? Oh, that's we? right. Um, I wrote a book. Yeah, you, you wrote a book. You wrote a book. Um, again, our viewers can't uh, forget be here because there's a huge number of them set up in front of the camera. Uh, but Pure Invention uh, is is the name of the book. Uh, could you comment on the name of the book real quickly for us? Yeah, so Pure Invention is actually, the title is taken from a very famous quote by a 19th century poet, and a playwright named Oscar Wilde. And at the time... We know who Oscar um, Wilde is, yes. The, the world was gripped by a fad for things Japanese. Like, we, we tend to think of being into Japan as a kind of modern, kind of high-tech thing, but actually at the turn of the 20th century, from the 19th mm-hmm. to the 20th century, there was this huge boom for things Japanese called the Japanism movement. And okay. Things art from Japan really influenced like the Impressionists and people like that. Um, the ukiyo-e, Bando, those, that stuff. ukiyo-e, all of this Japanese pottery, all of this Japanese uh, clothing and, and cloth and all sorts of things coming in to the Western marketplace, especially Europe and France, mm-hmm. which were then the kind of center of the uh, Western cultural world. And people got so obsessed with Japan, but they never actually went there or made much of an effort to interact with Japanese people because they couldn't. Back in time, there was no way to get in an airplane or anything like that. So they had built up this crazy, crazy image of Japan in their heads as being this kind of idealized fantasy land. And Oscar Wilde famously said, Japan does not exist it is a pure invention. There is no such country. There is no such place or people. Really? Okay. If you want to visit Japan, just go to your living room and look at your ukiyo-e prints that you imported. And, <laughs> and of course, he he wasn't saying Japan didn't exist. He was pointing a thing. He was poking fun at people who had kind of invented this fantasy of Japan. Uh huh. And that's where the title comes from because my book is all about fantasies, fantasies oh, yeah. that it Japan sure has created, and and kind of exported to the world. So first of all, thanks for getting me an advanced electronic copy of your work because I was able to uh, to read it before the uh, the printed version came out. Um, but I found it absolutely fascinating and read it stem to stem in no time at all. Excellent. Um, I've you know as a lot of our viewers know, I've been involved in Japan for 32 years. Uh, I've been involved in the hobby industry for most of that time. So one would think that I'm some kind of a specialist expert genius on all things related to Japanese pop culture, and I certainly am probably a cut above the run of the mill person. But I learned so much from your book. Um, well, that's the whole, great to hear. The fact that the toy industry itself, I was embarrassed to learn that I didn't know this. The toy industry itself is what helped bring Japan out of the ashes of yes. World War II. Well, it's actually um, not only that. It's, what, it's, what, it's how Japan became a kind of modern nation. The first thing Japan was exporting at the turn of the 20th century and basically leading up to World War II were toys. Mm-hmm. Celluloid and tin toys. That was, yeah, they were competing I, with Germany. I knew those things existed, but I didn't know they had played such an enormous role in the country's recovery. Yeah, yeah. And like it was really interesting to me to see uh, old newspaper clippings of American toy industry people furious at Japanese toy makers and demanding that the president of the U.S. put tariffs on Japanese toy imports. And this is like 1910. It's not wow. like it's not like the 70s, the 80s or last week. It's 1910, you know. Um, <laughs> it hasn't even so, had, we haven't even had World War 1 yet at that exactly, point. Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. Okay. And it's it's this this kind of, you know, J- Japan always had a reputation for making these kind of intricate playthings. Mm-hmm. You know, from the very beginning, it was it was toys and playthings that really attracted uh, uh, people's attention, and uh, it was toys and playthings that kind of elevated Japan to a, uh, a full fledged exporting importing nation after it right. opened. 
Well, your book covers a lot of those uh, those physical things that Japan created. Um, I'm probably can't going to be able to get a complete list from memory here, but uh, besides the uh, the famous tin jeep uh, toy that you you talk about at the yes. beginning, uh, we get into, of course, uh, the Walkman and uh, the Nintendo uh, and a lot of other products as well. Uh, but then a lot of your book also focuses on the the soft side of of Japanese exports. You know the media, uh, manga and anime, uh, particular products such as Hello Kitty, uh, Pokemon, of course, uh, and even into at the very end of the book, you talk about you know uh, Nichan and Fortchan and Eichan and, and and all of that uh, aspect of it too. But what what do you what is it about? Japanese culture or, or Japanese pop culture, I guess, if you can sum it up uh, succinctly, probably more succinctly than I can. Uh, what is it that so grabs the world compared to, I mean, why don't we have like more, <clears throat> you know, UK stuff, for example, or more Italian stuff? I mean, they all have their local their local things, right? But I mean, when it comes to the UK, there's a bit, I mean, we got, you know, Downton Abbey and things of that nature, but what is it about Japan that just so grabs everyone? One of the things I realized when I was writing the book Mm -hmm. is that a big reason that these things that Japan makes grab our, our hearts and minds so much is because Japan as a nation kind of got to the future a little bit ahead of the Western world. It, after World War II, mm-hmm. it was nothing. And then it kind of hyper-urbanized. Mm-hmm. And then in 1990, it experienced this epic economic crash. The burst of the bubble, yeah. And that ushered in what is known as the Lost Decades, which lasted for about 20 years. Uh-huh. Now, in that period, Japan produced things that we found incredibly compelling because they fit needs that we didn't even know that we had. Mm -hmm. Um, Americans weren't producing anything like the Walkman. We didn't even know that we wanted a portable music player, but Japanese people in dense urban environments uh, were the people who it was made for. And as America urbanized too, and as we started to conglomerate into these dense urban environments ourselves, it it fit a need that we didn't even know that we had. You know, ditto for things like anime, which slotted in as, you know, anime is basically appealing towards teenagers. Right. Uh, in the West, especially in like the 80s and, and early 90s, cartoons were for kids. We mm-hmm. didn't have really any uh, history of illustrated entertainment in America that was aimed at that kind of teen audience. So it really fit this need. Hello Kitty. There was nothing like Hello Kitty you know, this kind of no. packaging of, of nurturing and cuteness, um, <laughs> all sorts of things like that. So each one of the products in the book, which I call a fantasy delivery device, is mm-hmm. something that kind of reached us like a, a missive from the future. And as we consumed these things, they really profoundly transformed the way that we lived our lives. Mm-hmm. These weren't just products. They actually taught us new ways to live, like it's very difficult to imagine a world where we aren't plugged into electronic devices, listening to music and watching videos all right, the time. Right. That's, that's one thing that really strikes me about your book is, is some people, when they hear about the description of your book, you know, in fact, right on the cover here, it says how Japan's pop culture conquered the world. And some people might think, oh, I'm not really all that interested in Japan's right. culture or Japan pop culture. Sure, sure. And the most important thing, the most important takeaway I think anybody should have from this book is, no, no, the point is, it's no longer Japan's pop culture. Yes. It's yours. It's your exactly. pop culture now. The, 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 <laughs> one, of the, one of the kind of counterpoints or counter themes of the book is that Japan really japanized the world's tastes it didn't japanize the world i mean you know america is still america england still england china is still china and and all of that but the the way we consume things really mimics the way that japanese consume things in the 90s and early 2000s like we've all kind of become otaku now you know which is the japanese word for a hyper consumer we're grown-ups but we still watch superhero movies Mm -hmm. you know back when i was a kid even in high school, you didn't admit that you were reading comic books. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I think personally, I, no, I noticed, and it may not have been, of course, solely because of this, but to me, it seems like when Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings films were so well made and got so much praise from you know the Academy as well, then all of a sudden it was okay to be a nerd now. Right, because, right. Because nerdism had been elevated to you know a high art level, I guess. Uh, yeah, and it seemed like now it was okay to you know put on elf ears. Or that something, was a, that was know, a big one. Point. You know what? I, I actually yeah. think that the uh, Marvel's first Iron Man movie was a huge uh, uh, you know crack in that wall of mm-hmm. you know being adults being able to enjoy this kind of 
quote unquote juvenile entertainment. It was hip, you know. It had yeah, cool yeah. actors in it. It was well written. It was well directed, um, and it and technology had advanced to the point where Iron Man looked cool. You know, if it had been filmed in the seventies, it would have been a guy wearing like a spandex suit. <laughs> It would have looked like a Power yes. Rangers show, right? And yes. but thanks to the, thanks to the miracle of CG, Iron Man actually looks really awesome, like Iron Man. Yeah, almost better like than Iron Man. Exactly. Iron Man. I mean, and I, you know, and Iron Man was my favorite Marvel hero as a kid by far. You know, he was kind of the most Japanese. Like, really, you know, I, I was always a Thor too. guy, but ah, <laughs> uh, interesting. I was no, I just love the idea that if I got rich enough, I could build this like armored suit for myself and fly around, yeah. which is basically <laughs> the plot of every you know anime from back then. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. I, Although they're on a much larger scale. And not only that, so, yeah. and Amuro doesn't even want to fly his giant armor. You know, I'm like, Amuro, man, like you've got this Gundam. Just enjoy it. You know? well, it's, the, it's the same in Eva, too. What is this thing with Japanese protagonists who really don't want to be heroes? You know, well, they're just kind of like. The honest, do you want the honest answer? Sure, sure. Go for it. Because Japan lost the war. You know, as, uh, as Americans, you know, we see, you know, who, who experienced World War II and, and, and from a completely opposite side, obviously. Mm. To us, it was a triumphant moment. For Japan, it wasn't. And right. their entire civilization was basically leveled. So, you know, th one of the things that I think is so compelling about Gundam as a story and a lot of anime is that they are war narratives written by the losing side. And it gives you a really valuable insight into, you know, it's a lot different from a lot of raw, raw American entertainment. Mm -hmm. You know, even the kind of raw -er American entertainment, like, for instance, Saving Private Ryan, is right. triumphant in the sense that we won the war and, and we, we like to think that we made the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the protagonists and antagonists in Gundam are all suffering. Like, life just sucks for them. Because yeah, yeah, in, real, in real wars, there's no, there's nothing good about them. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of alternate viewpoint, that counterpoint to kind of the Western view, which, which really manifests in Evangelion, because that's not even about war. That's about the crumbling of, you know, adult culture and, and crumbling of, of any kind of guideposts or guidelines for growing up or, or making your way through this kind of post-apocalyptic uh, mm -hmm. world. Uh, that kind of stuff is, especially in the form of illustrated entertainment, was something we just didn't have in the West. Yeah, and no, it's, I, a, it's, it's a good point. I hadn't was, really, hadn't really considered that the, the very different perspective from the other side of the the, the, the war, uh, right. as being something that really uh, moved directly into those sorts of themes in their pop culture. Well, if you read chapter six, seven, seven of my book, you'll see that this all fits into one uh, big piece of a puzzle. But seriously, it, it is actually in chapter seven of the book where we talk about there was a there was actually a very long period of time in Japan where manga and anime were pretty much just for kids too. Mm -hmm. uh, anime in particular was was there, there actually was manga for adults but anime was really considered kid stuff and then around the late 70s there was a big turning point first with a anime called Yamato which is a sort of retelling of World War II uh, in space where the Japanese Yamato battleship rescues you know human civilization and then to an even greater extent with Gundam which right. went you know, its movies came out in the early 1980s, just completely upended the idea of what anime could be. It became not just a product to be consumed and not just a vehicle for selling other products like Gunpla. It became an identity, yeah, which yeah. is what anime really is these days for most people who consume it. It's an identity for them. And that's also a very much a Japanization of the way that we live our lives. All right. So, yeah, no, that, that, that all kind of makes sense to me. Um, let's go back to your book for a moment. Um, the book itself, uh, obviously an incredible labor of love, and I've touched on many of the themes that are in it or products that are discussed. I just cannot imagine how much digging and how much time you must have spent to get up some of the, the, the trivia and amazing uh, details that are in this thing. How long were you working on the book before it was published just this past month? Well, it took me a year of working with my agent to pull the proposal together. Wow. And that was a very difficult process. Mm -hmm. um, and proposals at, at this level are not like just one or two pages uh, saying, I'm going to write this, hey, check it out. You, you, you really have to write big chunks of the book to kind of prove on the promise. And also they include all sorts of things like marketing prospectuses and right. stuff like that. So that took about a year to pull together. And, and that alone was like 200 pages. 
Wow. So um, it was a big deal. And then, you know, we shopped it around to a, a bunch of publishers, again, thanks to my agent, who was a really great guy. And uh, then when it was picked up in late, in the fall of 2019, mm-hmm. it was picked up by Crown, which is a uh, an imprint of Penguin Random House, with the instruction that it had to be ready to be published for the 2020 Olympics. <laughs> so, <laughs> which, yes, now, now I, I, you know, hindsight is 2020. Um, so it, it, things didn't quite play out that way, but we didn't know yeah, that the Olympics would be canceled, not. obviously. Yeah. So I had to barrel through actually writing the book over the course of a little over a year, which is an insane pace I don't ever want to do that again. <laughs> wow. Uh, was... You know, there, there's so many. I just think the number of appointments and interviews and yeah. all of the logistics that had to come together to, to do this kind of research. You know, again, we could go on for hours about it, but let me just pick out one point that was really for me when I was reading the book. Uh, it was particularly. Um, well, moving, I guess, is the word, because I could almost, you know, put myself or imagine myself in your shoes and think of how moved uh, I would have been in that situation. And that's the chapter on karaoke. Ah, uh, Mr. Uh, Negishi. Yes, Mr. Negishi. Um, karaoke, you know, okay, I'm I'm a lover. Uh, these days with Corona, I haven't been out uh, in months, uh, sadly. But I do love to go out and, you know, have a few beers with my friends and, and you know, finally pick up the mic and go for it. Um, and it's amazing, you know, that it was developed so relatively recently to me because, you know, I haven't actually gone to ever gone karaoke in the United States, I must confess, but for personal reasons, I get to the Philippines quite a bit. Oh, it's huge and, there. Oh my God. You, I can't, you wouldn't believe that it was not a, a native thing. It's because huge there. Well, actually there's a gentleman in the Philippines, in the Philippines who singing claims to have invented it. You know, maybe, maybe it was. I don't know. It could have been independently developed there, but because it is so ubiquitous yeah. in the Philippines, yes, that I can't believe that it's something that came from overseas so recently. But that's a, that's another maybe research project for somebody at some point. So one of the big eye openers when I was writing that chapter mm-hmm. is the realization that karaoke was not invented once in Japan. It was invented right. five times over this five year time period from about 1967 to 1972 by five different mm-hmm. people who had no idea of the other person's existence. <laughs> so there was like really something in the air in Japan around that time that made people need karaoke. And so what was Negishi-san's role in all of that? How does he become sort of the poster child for karaoke? So uh, Negishi-san is the gentleman who invented the first karaoke machine. Okay. Um, and he was working, he ran a company here in Tokyo that assembled like tape decks and stuff for other companies. Right. And so he had, he and his engineers had all the parts laying around to, to, to make this device. And he loved singing and he made it. And he actually went around selling it for quite a few years. But the person who is actually most, he isn't the person who's most intimately associated with it. That's a guy named Daisuke Inoue. And Inoue-san, who invented the machine, uh, a similar machine in Kobe, is much more recognized now because he was also a band leader. And he had this critical understanding that Negishi-san didn't, which is that we're all terrible singers. (laughs) And so uh, Inoue-san actually re-recorded hit songs at like a slower tempo to make them easier for amateurs like us. Is he the guy who came up with the echo control? Because that's yeah, so you put an echo in. It was it was (laughs) back then it was a spring. It was like a you would actually run the 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 vocal output through a spring. That's what a that's what a that would give it a literal twang. That's how it worked back then. So he actually modified the soft the software, the songs to Mm -hmm. be these kind of virtual versions of hits whereas negishi san had just used instrumentals of of professional professionally recorded but you know negishi san invented the machine he's the one who okay. came up with this device and uh it was he's the first person to ever have a karaoke party in his house uh in his kitchen <laughs> where we sat to talk about the book and that <laughs> little moments like that you know i also yeah. met the gentleman who engineered the nintendo entertainment system the famicon and talking to him i mean how many hours did i spend on the famicon on the on the nintendo the nes as a kid i, I can't even count them oh yeah yeah same here you know so getting to meet a lot of these people behind these devices was a, a sort of personal quest of mine and i like to think of the book as a kind of detective story where i'm trying to unravel this question of why does japan have this pull on all of us Mm -hmm. i hope i answered it uh yeah it's it's something that's quite fascinating and and you know really although i kind of knew 
about all of these devices and, and, and pop culture icons. And of course, if you'd asked me at any given moment, you know, where does Pokemon come from, whatever, I would have known that the answer was Japan for all of them. Right. But the thing is, it, when your book comes out and it brings all of that together under one cover, it kind of reinforces just how huge Japan's impact has been. And I guess even being so deeply immersed in it as I have been for most of my adult life, your book really brought it home in a, in a new way for me. And, and well, I, you know, it's funny. There's been a lot of books and mm. some great books written about individual aspects of Japanese pop culture. There's great mm. books about like anime and like the history and the impact of anime or yeah. uh, there's great books written about Sony and like, you know, the rise of Sony. There's great right, books, right. you know, written about like Sanrio and Hello Kitty. Um, and kawaii culture, but there's very few books out there that kind of try to explore it from a multifaceted approach. Right. And, you know, I realized, you know, even if you're an anime fan, you're probably interacting with Japan in ways other than anime. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's no really one royal road into getting into things Japanese. It, it kind of suffuses our modern life because Japan, in many ways, created modern life. Mm -hmm. uh, with all of these gadgets that we use in daily life and all of the entertainment that we consume. So, yeah. you know, it, I actually was, when we decided to subtitle the book Conquer the World, I was a little bit hesitant at first because this wasn't any plan on Japan's part right. to take over the world. It happened because they got to the future a little ahead of the rest of us. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, you, as someone who spends a lot of time in Japan as well, probably is aware of this, but maybe some others aren't, is there's a lot of angst in Japan now because, you know, they're no longer number two in the world's economies. They've slipped yeah. to number three after Japan China. passing. Yeah, and, 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 you know, the Chinese are now bigger in a lot of manufacturing. Uh, there's a lot more talk in the press these days about China. You sure. know, it's all China-focused now rather than sure. Japan. It's like sure, sure. as if Japan has been eclipsed or whatever. Right. But I guess what, to me, a lot of Japanese people don't realize is that there's there's no Chinese pop culture. They're trying, but, but well, you there's, know, there's nothing that really infuses our lifestyle from China the way the things from Japan do even today. There, there, there is certainly amazing entertainment and amazing products coming out of Korea and and out of China but Japan's pull is more about a lifestyle right um and Japan's products of course there was a lot of competition going on in the sense of like Japanese cars or TVs kind of disrupting uh, Western marketplaces for things like that. Right. But the fantasy delivery devices that I talk about in my book blaze new trails. They blazed entirely new trails for us to consume things. And because we're consumer societies, by consuming those things, you know, we kind of transformed the yeah. way that we lived. So it's, you know, it's not so much a question of is Japan relevant anymore? We're right. all Japanese in a certain sense, not by ethnicity, of course, but in our right. kind of fantasy industrial dna you know the, the way that we create yeah. video games and consume them as adults right. the way we watch you know the th forms of entertainment that we that we consume the gadgets that we use right right maybe the best example of that that you cover in great detail in the book is the walkman um and i was fascinated as a huge apple fanboy right uh i was fascinated to learn that you know steve jobs himself was completely enamored with sony yes uh at the time and that he was gifted a walkman by none yes. other than akio moria himself yes and uh, according to your book he immediately took it home and instead of putting yeah, it he, in took, music, it, he, he, took, he it took it apart he took it apart <laughs> he took it apart so but you know um, and this is actually when people say to me like is japan relevant anymore and i'm like well how are you talking to me well, chances are they're talking to me on an iPhone. Right. And the iPhone literally would not exist without Sony's Walkman. It's mm -hmm. very much a American product that's built with literally Japanese sensibilities because Steve mm -hmm. Jobs was obsessed with Sony and with Japanese design, not just Sony, all sorts of Japanese mm -hmm. design, mm -hmm. and kind of worked that craftsmanship into the products that his uh, company produced. Right. So like, I, I think right now, instead of, you know, in our, in our current era, this isn't the era of made in Japan anymore. Right. It's the era of made anywhere else with Japanese values. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's yeah. the world we're living in right now. And uh, it, it, so from a certain standpoint, Japan's as relevant as ever. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, but we do get a bit of a sense in your book, and now when you when you look around uh, in in the world as we've just discussed, you know there's there's not so much of the bam here's another new fresh cool amazing thing we would have never thought of from yes. Japan. Yes. Uh, you know with with music uh, now you know K-pop is all sure. the thing. Oh yeah, um, BTS. You know, 
perhaps there's a slight revival of anime interest now that uh, the Ghibli movies are all streaming uh, sure, uh, sure. widely. Sure. Uh, there, but but you know we haven't had anything from Japan nominated for an Academy Award. In fact, that was another thing that went to Korea recently, of course, with uh, and very deservedly uh, so. Parasite is yeah, an amazing yeah. movie. Yeah, I thought it was a- as well, and I was I was actually quite uh, happy that the Academy had you know the guts to vote for yeah uh, for, something a, for a change and for yeah, best picture you, yeah. exactly. Pick something interesting. How unique, <laughs> you know? It's um yeah definitely definitely so. But you know the. The, the, I think that the key thing to remember here is you might remember a few minutes ago saying Japan got to the future ahead of us. Right. Well, that happened in ways both exciting and kind of scary. And one of the scary ways in which Japan got to the future first is that it's now what's known as a hyper-aging society. People yes. are having less families or having less and less kids or no kids at all. And the birth rate has declined to the point where in another 20 to 30 years, there's going to be more elderly people in Japan than young people. Yeah, well, now, the population is already shrinking, too. Exactly. And it's shrinking. And this trend is actually set to happen in the West as well. It's already starting to happen in England, Europe, and America. Italy, Italy and Germany are also, yeah, shrinking populations. I exactly. So this is another, now Japan has kind of, uh, some pundits in Japan have re-envisioned the country as, what do they call it, a kadai senshin koku, which means a advanced, <laughs> a, an, a, yeah. a, a country that is at the forefront of dealing with problems. Issues unique, problems, yeah, yeah. Unique to advanced societies. And one of those is how do you deal with a hyper-aging uh, populace? And there's no clear answer to that. Japan is literally at the forefront of that. So, you know, maybe in another 20 years, we're going to be hearing about a Japanese revolution that's driven entirely by elderly people or elder care or something like that. Mm-hmm. We're literally going into a zone where no human civilization has ever gone before. Are you uh, familiar with the anime short Rojin Zedo? Or yes. Rojin? yes, they were all going to be in these giant, like, you know, mechanized beds or something. Yeah, mechanized nursing um, exactly. robots that, you know, literally uh, wipe your butt for you. Well, that's uh, you know, one of the so things I'm, you know, it's, it's actually a huge question. Like, can a hyper age society contribute to global culture in a, in a meaningful way that, that younger societies can? And the jury is still out on that. We don't know because, again, this right. is, you know, to boldly go where no civilization has gone before in ways. Uh, cool and scary. Well, we'll uh, we'll have to hope that uh, you know Japan uh, continues to uh, develop in that area too, because you know uh, you're you're still you're still in your forties, right? Um, yes. I'm, I'm securely into my mid fifties now right. and starting to think about those sorts of uh, so, those sorts of issues. So you have uh, to. You- <laughs> <laughs> well, we're way off the topic of gunpla, but this is, we are, but this is yeah, actually, yes, no, but this is, and I actually, we're sort of off the topic of gunpla because mm-hmm. I think, I, I don't know this, but my feeling is that Bandai is selling way more Gundam kits to people of your age and my age <laughs> than they are to kids. Yeah, they keep trying to do things, you know, to get the, the youngsters back in and, and hook them into, you know, a whole progression of consumption over a lifetime. Sure. Uh, you know, we had the, the Dambodo Senki stuff a few yes, years ago, yes. which uh, actually did succeed, yeah, uh, in getting the kids back yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, and also, what were um, all those Gunpla Builders ones? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, and, which are, I think are really fun. Those are actually really cool. But And, of course, uh, Tamiya is still, uh, to some degree, successful with the mini four-wheel drive cars, right, uh, right. which actually have kids keeping their hands on things and building things. Yes, yes. Um, because, I'm, you know, I'm a firm believer, as a lifelong scale model builder myself, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer that once you've actually built something, done a pretty good job of it, and now have it on your shelf to admire for the rest of your life, it gives you a special kind of pleasure that you're never going to sure. get out of, you know, a, a really uh, pithy Facebook post. Sure, sure. <laughs> You know, I, I'm still a huge collector of, of not only of the kits that I built over the years, but of models and toys and all sorts of things like that. And it, it's, but you know, we, I, I think young people these days, we made it as a society, as a civilization, we transitioned from hardware to software. Right. And, you know, I think Pokemon, like around that period was really the big flip because kids didn't want figures of the Pokemon. They wanted cards. They wanted the actual data of the monster in the right. game more than they wanted a physical manifestation of it. And uh, I remember noticing that and being like, wow, you know, there's not a lot of Pikachu products out. You know, they, they mainly want cards and stickers and stuff like that. Or um, they just want to play Pokemon Go, which is... Exactly. Well, that's the modern the most successful games ever for and, smartphones, right? If not the most successful game ever. Who, over a billion downloads, it's crazy. Who, and actually, that's another great example of made everywhere else with Japanese sensibilities. It's made in Silicon Valley. But right, it uses right. Japanese characters. And uh, that's, so that's a really good example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. But also, mm-hmm. who in your area is playing the most Pokemon Go? In my area, it's elderly people. Ah, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, well, from the get go, though, it, it all seemed to be middle aged and and young. Well, by young adults, yeah. I mean like maybe thirties, forties. You know, people in that in that range, the ones who I guess had grown up with uh, the cards or something, uh, you know, took to it. I think a lot hotter than their kids did. Well, I see. I see way more grown ups playing it than kids. Mm-hmm. Way more kids definitely play it, but I noticed that they seem to be playing it together with their parents, like a kind of right, right, exactly, activity, exactly. Which is, I think, really you know, kind of sweet. Uh, I think that's kind of fun. It's a game the whole family can play and outdoors. Uh, so, which is sort of ironic because Pokemon was the original game that kind of brought the outdoors indoors. Like you're kind of exploring <laughs> the outside world on your Game Boy. So, but yeah. now it's gone back out again. And possibly the most, uh, the actually most useful. Uh, implementation of uh uh i want to say altered reality i mean I yes, have yes. the wrong word here uh augmented, augmented reality yes augmented reality. Uh, that's actually uh, well, such a perfect fit such a yeah. perfect that game was really a perfect storm because pokemon is all about monsters lurking in the real world around you and you having to find them right so it just it just fit that like a glove just a genius uh game concept okay well, Matt, I want to be respectful of your time, and uh, I do really appreciate the fact that you've uh, set aside some time to be with us today and lend us your unique insight into all things Japanese. Oh, uh, thanks for having um, me. My, uh, what I do want to tell our, our viewers is that we're going to uh, give away three copies of your book. Oh, which yes. We have, to, we have to arrange to get you to sign. Okay. Uh, so we're, we'll figure out something, the logistics on that, uh, in the very near future, of course. Excellent. But we're going to give away three copies of Matt's brand new book, Pure Invention. Uh, to three of the viewers of this podcast. Now, to qualify for our random drawing, just leave uh, some kind of a, a meaningful comment for us, please, uh, in the comment section of, uh, of this video. Uh, and not just the, the cute, uh, you know, it was great or something like that, but just, you know, get, give us some kind of a useful comment or a, uh, a thoughtful comment, and uh, we'll choose from among the folks who take a moment to uh, say something useful about it for us. Uh, but, but yeah, believe me, this is a great book. It reads uh, pretty quickly because it is so interesting, uh, and uh, I think everybody would be uh, great to add this to their, to their shelf. Uh, Hobby Link Japan will also continue to, to sell your book. We do have a few copies here. Oh, thank you. And although we're not going to give them all away, uh, <laughs> we're going to arrange for each and every one of them uh, to have Mr. Alt's signature in them. So Excellent. Well, you're the um, only place that has that because the mails have been shut down out of Japan. I can't, yes. I can't sign copies for fans. So yeah, this is, um, you're going to have an exclusive on this, at least for the short term. Woo-hoo. Uh, very, very good. Again, I'm, I'm, uh, I want to thank you again for arranging to have uh, an advanced copy for me uh, delivered so that I could, uh, I could get through it. My pleasure. Uh, the sad thing about the electronic version that I had is it didn't have the footnotes within it. Ah. Uh, so I couldn't refer back to the footnotes at the time I was, I was reading right. it. Uh, but the footnotes are also a really extensive. Uh, yes, because book. I didn't want this to be like Matt... Matt's memoir. I, I wanted this to be useful to like researchers in the future too. So I really made sure to be meticulous about, you know, footnoting every every claim that I made. Okay, excellent. All right, Matt. Well, we continue, of course, to hope that you uh, keep doing, keep up the good work, uh, keep translating uh, the manga and anime and stuff. Thank you. What, what are some that you've done? Like what the Dryman books and what? Are we tra- what's most recent. Uh, here's uh, the the most the, the most recent big video game we worked Neo, uh, which Tecmo Koei Tecmo put out. Okay. Hiroko and I uh, translated that. A big uh, game, uh, kind of with a lot of fighting of yokai, Japanese mm-hmm. monsters and folklore. Um, we also translated, yes, all of the Doraemon comics into English. That was quite a project over a, sort of a year. They're on of those, Kindle yeah. Store. The Kindle Store in America is where you can get the Doraemon comics. Okay. And lots of other stuff. Just, you know, check out my website, uh, altjapan.com, and also mattalt.com. Mm-hmm. Or you can follow me on Twitter, matt underscore alt. Um, mm-hmm. Instagram, I'm on there too. Alt Matt Alt. Oh, you are. Just just keep doing these combinations of Alt and Matt. You'll find me. <laughs> well, it's a, a very short but very unique name. So I don't think anybody's going to have uh... people. People think it's a pen name. It's not. It's my birth name. It really is. I guess my ancestors were very forward looking to a time when on the internet <laughs> Alt would mean you know something, you know, useful for an internet uh, right. type usage. Well, yeah, keep uh, keep bringing uh, Japan to the West and all the great ways you've continued to do it, sir. And. Uh, uh, we'll try to continue, of course, to do the product part of it, but yes. we'll have to leave the culture part of it to you, I'm afraid. But... Keep slinging those gunpla. <laughs> we will. <laughs> All right. Thanks again for spending time with us today, Matt. It's been incredibly insightful. Pleasure and again, to be everybody, here. pick up a copy wherever it may be of Pure Invention by Matt Alt. You will not regret it. Thanks for watching. Take care, and we'll see you next time.